Hello everybody, welcome and thank you to everybody here and to the panel. Um, we've pretty, got a fairly star-studded cast today, um, but before we, I introduce them to you all, um, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of the country that the University of Wollongong would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, uh, the Alori, Wadiwadi and Darawal people on whose land we stand today. We would like to pay our respects to elders past, present and those of the future. And those here today uh, who are on this panel to discuss industrial foundations uh, include uh, Ron Cairns, who is in the middle there. Uh, we have um, Professor Paul Carr, Professor Jan Nemchik, and Professor Naj Aziz, uh, and of Kinemont, um, who's probably the most venerable of this venerable panel. <laughs> <laughs> My name is, is Di Kelly. Uh, I'm in the history discipline at the university. And what I would like to do is to just briefly uh, talk about each of these extremely talented people, and then we will uh, ask uh, Ron to describe uh, his perspectives on coal mining locally and nationally. Ron, of course, uh, following in his father's footsteps, has had a long and illustrious career in mining and worked as an apprentice electrical fitter at AINS Wangawillery Colliery from 1944. His various career roles have included tradesman electrician, leading hand, mine electrical engineer at the AIS Mount Kimber Colliery, Assistant Under Manager and Mine Electrical Engineer at Camero Colliery, Electrical Mechanical Engineer and Mine Under Manager at Appen Colliery, and Assistant Supervising Engineer, Chief Electrical Engineer and Chief Engineer of the AIS Collieries. In 1979, when the AIS, AINS Collieries, Australian Iron and Steel Collieries, joined with the BHP Collieries in Newcastle to become Steel Division Collieries, Ron was appointed Manager Engineering of the Steel Division Collieries and later worked for BHP Engineering Group as an international consultant. After that extremely busy career, he retired and established an engineering consultancy to the mining industries in New South Wales and Queensland. He was a member of the Mineral Heritage Committee of the Illawarra branch of the OzIMM, Australian Institute of Mines and Metals. Mm -hmm. uh, was mining. A, hmm? mining and Metals. Mining. Thank you. Mounting and Metallurgy, thank you. So it was an associate producer of the DVD Beneath the Black Skies by Y Documentary, and in 2010 and again in 2017, authored part one, A History of Prospecting and Development of Coal Mining in the Illawarra and Shopnaven, and part two, A History of Prospecting and Development of Coal Mining in the Illawarra, Southern Highlands and Barragarang Valley. He is currently involved in the ongoing development of a website, Illawarra Heritage Trail, which is an ongoing project that was officially launched in April 2016. I think with that uh, introduction to, to Ron, um, we can see that he is a, a, a wonderful person to talk to us about the industrial foundations today. Later we will ask Professor Paul Carr, who started at the university in 1973 in the Department of Geology and he retired in December 2015. During this period of over 40 years, Paul has taught uh, geology at all undergraduate and postgraduate levels and supervised a wide range of honours postgraduate students and projects. He has published extensively in the geology and geological evolution of the Illawarra and Sydney Basin, and he has also developed an interest in historical ge geology, particularly on how early geological exploration in the Illawarra influenced later mining. Professor Naj Aziz is an honorary professor, professor or fellow of mining and engineering at the University of Wollongong, He's been here since 1981. He is the holder of BSc Graduate Diploma in Metal Mining and PhD in Rock Mechanics. All three degrees are from the University of Wales in the UK. Professor Aziz has 
of Aziz has had a team of seven PhDs and a postdoctoral fellow working with him on various important projects. His current research interests include Baltic technology, I hope you'll talk about that again in a minute, mine gases and outburst control. His current um, his methodology of testing cables and bolts is now actually a recognised as a standard adopted by major mining companies in Australia and beyond for the evaluation of the sheer strength of, of, of rebar and cable bolt. Professor Aziz has several mining engineering websites on long wall mining, board and pillar mining, coal and gas outputs and rock bolting. These websites attract around half a million hits a year um, and he's currently chairman and conveyor of the Coal Operators Conference. This conference is an annual event which is dedicated to the coal mining, both surface and underground mining. The conference is the longest annual held conference in the history of the university, uh, which has more than, oh, excuse me, 220, oh, NARD has more than 220 publications to its credit, has been keynote speaker, at various conferences, as well as being external examiner to many PhD theses nationally and internationally, as well as reviewing major journals. Uh, Bob Kinnamont uh, is a mining engineer who graduated from the University of Otago, which is where I was born, so it's a good place, with a BE, uh, Bachelor of Engineering in Mining. He has had experience in England, New Zealand and Australia before joining ICI as the explosives field engineer. He's also worked as senior inspector for the inspector at New South Wales Department of Mines. He's been an active member of the Melbourne, Sydney and Illawarra branches of the Institute, as well as operating as Illawarra branch chairman. Other roles have included the secretary and also chairman of the heritage subcommittee of the branch. He belonged to the group that, that worked in the joint venture by, with Why Documentaries of, of uh, Beneath the Black Skies on the History of Coal Mining in the Illawarra. Rob is the co-author of Mining Monograph 21, History of Coal Mining in Australia, and with Ernest Barfield as co-editor, completed a revision of Monograph 12, Australian Coal Mining Practice, that was published by the IMM in 2009. I noticed when I looked Bob up in the library catalogue, he's actually listed as having 15 publications in there, so very impressive. Uh, Dr. Nat Jan Nemchik, last but very much not least, uh, is the, uh, a mining engineering senior lecturer at the School of Mining and Environmental Engineering here at the University. He's a member of the Australian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, holds a PhD in mining engineering and mine geomechanics, and many publication credits, including statistical analysis of underground stress measurements in Australian coal mines. His current professional activities include the curriculum review of future mining engineering subjects at the University of Wollongong, showing the, the way we're looking at the past, the present, and the future, presentations of the state-of-the-art knowledge, techniques and industry practice at universities uh, and with TAFE colleagues. He's also involved in publications of booklets for tertiary education and the industry training and oversees a significant load of UOW mining research graduate students. So as you can see, I wasn't wrong when I said we have a star-studded cast today. <coughs> with all of that, could I ask Ron to perhaps give us a, an overview uh, of uh, the history of mining globally and locally. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Well, stay seated, John. <laughs> yep. Well, perhaps I should start at the beginning, and uh, the beginning really is that uh, coal was found here in 1797 in Coltus by uh, some uh, men who had been on the boat, so I was actually on the boat that uh, had uh, gone aground in Bass Strait. And they decided, the uh, captain decided, I guess, that they should go back to Sydney Cove and rescue the ship. They set off to do that, 15 of them, and washed ashore on the east coast of New South Wales, and the boat was wrecked, as were their supplies. So they set off to walk 350 kilometres back to Sydney Cove. By the time they got to Austin here, there were five of them left. They'd had all sorts of difficulties, including starvation and 
arguments, sorry, problems with the writers, if I can put it that way. And uh, three of them were able to, uh, and, I, and I did fire with some coal I found there. So that was a thing that made it happen as it were. And uh, two of them stayed and the other three went on. They were picked up by a fishing boat by a mile. Got back to Sydney Cove and uh, Governor Hunter asked George Bass to come down and confirm what they had told him. And then he came down and confirmed that yes, there was a seam of coal there, and you could see it from the boat, and uh, it was it was the real thing. Well, unfortunately uh, for here, coal was also found in Newcastle at about the same time, and the preference was to start mining coal in Newcastle, which they did. So here it was to stand still because it was landlocked, as it were, and it wasn't until uh, at, at the same time the. Uh, the mining in the colony had been granted uh, to the Australian Agricultural Company and they had a 30 year monopoly on the coal. So it wasn't until the mid-1850s that that monopoly was extinguished and, and immediately it was uh, Captain Schubert who owned property on Mount Kira opened a small mine up there and that was the very first mine to open in the area and uh, it was great uh, jubilation here we are, we've got, now got a mine, this would be a good thing for us. Unfortunately for Schubert, he didn't have a lot of money, and he decided to auction mine and property he had, and uh, it went into the Osmond family. Now Osmond was a fellow, George Osmond was a fellow who owned a lot of property. They, he opened the mine yeah, with another fellow for the auction, who was an engineer, and they opened what became known as the, uh, Os the Osmond Wall End Mine, and it kept that name for years and years and years. And it just took on from there. And once that happened, and mines, and they started producing coal in quantity, ships arrived to take the coal out of the harbour at uh, Wollongong, which was very primitive, and other mines started. The next one started about two years later in Winona by uh, Hale. He built a jetty, and so it went on. And uh, underneath the Seacliff Bridge is the jetty mine, or was the jetty mine, and it uh, is became part of the cult of Crowley later. But there was a jetty there and there was a mine there and there's still some coal you can see. Can I just strike in there, Ron? Is that the picture behind you? Is that the jetty of no, the jetty? No, that's, no, that's, that's the jetty of Ostermere. Okay. And there were several of those. They were all in a very exposed position and frequently washed away. So that was a problem, mm -hmm. I have to say. It wasn't until 1888 when the railway came through from Sydney that it was able to get coal away on that sort of mean, and by that means rather. And then of course in 1890 the, uh, the uh, government decided that it might be a good thing because the little jetty and loading facilities at Belmore Basin as we now know were overtaxed completely. They were loading large quantities of coal on the Great Defugit. And by that time the Mount Kemba Colliery had opened and put a jetty into what we now know as a Port Kemba mine. Uh, it's Harbour, followed in 1889 by the Southern Coal Company who tried to start a mine on, on Mount Kembla, which turned out to be a, a dead duck. Uh, and uh, they had built a jetty uh, and uh, put an incline into the mine but had to abandon it. So Port Kembla tended then to take on some real importance as a, as a port. It attracted people like uh, the Hoskins brothers. They were operating steel plant in Zivko. They were paying for coal to go from here, coke to go from here, to up there, which was quite expensive. And they ultimately decided they would move to Port Kimberley, and they did that with great difficulty. And I should say that in the midst of what I had said earlier, the fine coal that was loaded by the contract miners, these guys worked on contract, and there were about 15 mines along the coast in really no time at all after the first one happened. Loaded the coal initially with four. Small coal fell through the fork across and they were paid for the larger coal. Later on, there were screening plants put on the surface and they screened out the small coal because it was considered to be unusual and unsold. It was then found out it made an excellent coke. And so immediately, coking plants sprung up along here, helped by the fact that gold was found in Victoria, uh, Broken Hill would start lead, zinc, and silver. They needed coking coal later on. So there was a market immediately for coke. Some of that stuff went off, <coughs> excuse me, went off overseas. One minute. Hmm? One minute. You've got one minute. Okay. And that was about it. 
for my part, I just worked in the industry, and from there, it went from contract mining to mechanised mining, from mechanised mining meaning cutters and loaders, then it went from that to run machinery and continuous miner, and in more recent times to long wall mining, where they take, block out a large area of coal and completely extract it and produce large tonnages of coal. It was 250 people and thereabouts could produce 3 million tonnes of coal a year. That's about the story, that's what it's up to. Thank you, Ron. Well, I'm sorry to cut you short. No, that's all right. We could all listen to that story. But, that's all right. We've got to get everybody into that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, thank you. Can I take that sure. thing back? Now, that makes a lovely segue into what's been structured as my bit. Um, which is talking about the history of the university. Uh, one of the things that is evident in the main street of Wollongong is the statue, the coal statue, which shows the modern miner with safety gear pulling out the out of the bit the traditional miner who was very vulnerable. Uh, and it reminds us just how central coal has been to the history of this region. And as Ron said, once you've got people like the Hoskins brothers saying, well, heck, instead of us going up there, sending coal away down here, we'll start producing steel down here because that's where the coal is, that's where the port is. That's when you get the development of, of Wollongong. And if we do a very quick leap of 50 years of, and we come through to the 1950s, we start to see Wollongong as this highly industrial town depending on coal and depending on industry, depending on shipping for its absolutely burgeoning growth through the 1950s. And so, not surprisingly, you start to get people saying, we need a town, we need to have our own facilities, we need our own education, we need our own community. And this, of course, was happening at the time when the government itself was starting to say, we need more university graduates. We, at that time, fewer than 5% of people went on to university and usually only people with, with quite a lot of money because that was the only people who could afford to, except where you could go on scholarship or you were a cadet from somewhere like the steelworks. So what you get in the 1950s is a will to develop our own educational institution. You get a will to develop more university education and you get an awareness that, that Wollongong as a town was no longer a series of mining villages which it had been for the previous uh, 100 or so years, but it was becoming a, a, an independent and discrete city. So we get the building of the University of, of the development of the University of Wollongong. The first lectures were over at the TAFE in uh, Coniston uh, in the early 1950s, but then in 1962 we started on this site here, and approximately where we were standing looks like it was probably a corn farm. We're still trying to understand whether it was government land uh, or uh, uh, leased land by farmers, it was a mixture. But there was this ideal, driven by the great Frank Matthews, that this whole region would be a, a, an educational precinct. Starting with the Teachers College, most westerly, which is now about where Building 19 and where the Creative Arts buildings are and all of those, down through to a university, then down through to the TAFE, and then further down to the Kira and, and Wollongong High Schools. That notion of an education precinct was part of Wollongong saying we want to be separate, we want to be our own community. And from there, the university has grown in leaps and bounds in large part related to A, the need to, to educate, uh, particularly miners, metallurgists, civil, civil engineers and so on, but also to build the notion of education and build the region. So that industry, the region and the university have had very close links uh, all along the way. I know when I started here as a student in 1969, there were 1,300 students 
900 of whom were part-time and all working in mines and the steelworks and so on. Um, our, I, was, I was still into history at that time, so we were a very small, elite little lot out and tucked out in a corner. Um, and the university library was right down there in building one in, in engineering when I was there. Um, it was a room about this big, the university library at that time. So the university has grown with the community, it, but it has depended greatly and has worked with the community and we'll hear this as we talk to um, our other experts, but I think that's probably enough from me for the moment. So could I pass it perhaps on to you, Paul, um, and ask you about the geology, the geological expectations and um, how the interplay between local industry and geological, the community and the education, please. Thanks, Doug. Now I'm going to go back a little bit, back to 1839 when the first trained geologists came to Australia. Uh, this was the Reverend uh, William Branwhite Clark. He was a clergyman, obviously, but he had a very, very wide parish, so while he was wandering around on his horse administering to his flock, he could actually look at the geology. And fortuitously, later that year, so in December 1839, uh, the American exploring expedition sailed into Sydney. And part of the expedition was a very famous scientist and geologist called um, James Dwight Dana. So Clark and Dana quickly got together. They came down here um, in early 1840. And the result of that was that Dana published, he didn't publish until 1849, but in 1840 he developed it, sketched it, the first comprehensive geological map of any part of Australia. One of the problems at that stage was Obviously, Clark and other geologists brought their experience from the UK and, and Europe. And the problem really was the, the vast coal deposits in that part of the world, what are called Carboniferous, that's their age. It's a particular block of geological time. And so they brought that knowledge and experience here. The problem was that Carboniferous in Australia, basically there's very little of any coal, um, simply because of the geological development. We're, Australia's part of one one land. And it took a long time to sort out that issue, that the coal was completely different age. The mining techniques were okay, they could bring them across and do that. So then the coal mines started developing, but by about 1900, the New South Wales Geological Survey, uh, geologists from there did a lot of work. That culminated in 1915 with a very, very large tome on the southern coal field, very comprehensive geology. And then things went on, um, development obviously with the mines and geological techniques. And in 1963, um, Alan Cook, who eventually was the Foundation Professor of Geology here, he was appointed to the university from the Joint Coal Board. So the very first professor of geolo uh, geology here was actually a coal geologist, and naturally he developed a lot of research in the coal industry, and that went on through time. So over the years, there's been an enormous number of honours and postgraduate projects between the university and the mining companies in particular. Um, as time has gone on, that's become more and more environmental, so to speak. That's, that's particularly where the, the knowledge and expertise is needed. And so there's been this, this growing tradition with that. Going back to something Dice said, when I first came here, um, most of the students were part-time. And one of the things that developed very quickly was the university timetable. As you know, all our classes start on the half hour. Most places start on the hour. The reason is because of all the part-time students. They'd work to 5 p.m., come over here and start at 5.30, and away they went. And when I first started, geology practicals, for instance, were on Saturdays. It was to fit in with the part-time people. And now we've gone around the other way. So the timetable's mostly daytime things. So it's been an enormous influence, not just in the research and things, but also in the day-to-day -day things like timetables. Thank you very much, that's fascinating. Can we pass it on to, to you, Bob? I know we were talking about a different order, but if, if, um, it just seems that, that if we keep with the kind of historic focus on the history of coal mining and the development, uh, would you, could you give us some of that wonderful stuff you've got, please? Oh, I do. <laughs> the, um, the, one of the things that I think is important is the fact <coughs> that when they started mining in Newcastle, it was done with convict labour. And the convict of the transportation system didn't end until the 1840s. Uh, and when mining started down here, 
I guess if we'd still been uh, convict oriented, we might have had convicts in the mines here, but that didn't happen. However, a lot of the development in the area can be traced back to a convict influence because in 1837, the Wollongong Harbour was excavated uh, using convict labour. Now that, um, that meant that when mining did start, there was scope for small vessels to come in and be loaded and Wollongong Harbour was the first loading point for coal from this area and it was likely to stay that way except that the harbour wasn't big enough for the bigger boats that started to be built and of course the other mines along the coast as has been mentioned built jetties out and they, they were terribly successful because they got damaged by storms and uh, and so we, we now get to the stage where all the coal that goes locally by ship at least goes out from Port Kimberley uh, and, and of course some of it goes by rail and that's been mentioned as, a, and as, as an addition to the transport system which is available. The, um, the, as I mentioned Mining started in, in Newcastle and for a long time the work that was done involved what would, could be called pick and shovel mining, which meant it was very, very hard work. When explosives became available, uh, it meant that people who wanted to undercut the coal by hand and then shoot it down had to drill their own holes with the handheld uh, drilling equipment. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, electricity was, became available that there started to be an alternative in the powered drilling system. Uh, then, um, where do we go from there? Uh, that still left uh, a, a lot of work for people, uh, but in the late 1890s, there was a starting to be the introduction of coal cutters instead of picking away uh, an undercut so it could be shot down. A, a, a cutter would make a hole, uh, make a, an incision into the coal and then that could be used to relieve the shot so that, so that uh, it was, uh, the coal could be blasted. Still had to be loaded out by hand, mind you, uh, and that went on until about 1935 when uh, power loaders were introduced. And these were pickup uh, machines that would load the coal into probably small tubs at the start, but then eventually into shuttle cars, which were the bigger vehicles to carry the coal and put them perhaps on the conveyor belts. Uh, and so uh, the development continued then uh, uh, until continuous miners came in. And at the time that continuous miners came in, which was about the 19, between the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, suddenly the, the explosives field, the use of explosives diminished. There no need for explosives to shoot the coal down because the continuous miner could do the whole thing and could improve the way that pillars were um, extracted. And, uh, uh, and that went on for quite some time until the 60s, uh, although there had been long wall advancing used in various places, including on the south coast, uh, long wall retreat, which uh, has been mentioned by Ron, uh, involved, which involves extracting a big block of coal, came in and most of the most of the coal now, there's still got to be some development work to, to make the block of coal which is to be extracted, but most of the coal is now obtained by long wall retreat methods. And, Why is uh, it called long wall retreat? Well, because you put roadways out uh, a long way, uh, kilometers, kilometer press, yeah. uh, and then 
join them across and then take the big block of coal between those roadways, bring it back and let the, let the ground fall in <coughs> into the goat, as it was called, Thank which you. is the retreat. I don't think I need to say anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great this is a question. Yeah, we'll, we'll come to questions, I think, Bob. I think we'll. But at that, I, there's so much we don't know, isn't there? It's such fascinating stuff. Um, Naj, I wonder if you could talk to us about how the, in, indus, the industry has influenced the faculty in terms of uh, the engineering faculty, including the curriculum and also the role of the coal conference and so on. Mm. Um, historically. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Well, I, <coughs> excuse me, I was the first mining academic to be appointed at the University of Wollongong, I think, in, in 1981. I believe I arrived at Wollongong on the 6th of August, 81. By that time, there was a resurgence of uh, in, uh, enrollment of mining students and uh, it was quite a large number because usually mining goes through cycling period. That was the year in Mark indicated that there is a demand for us. So we started teaching mining. As, an, as a lone mining engineer, I had to rely on people like Bob and uh, Bob Off and uh, Bill Off or Lake Bill Off to assist in teaching. We continued like that for uh, seven years, six years, rather so, I'd rather say about three years, then we appointed our second academic member, and then ended up in third and fourth in 1986. Um, during that period, Australia, a lower branch of the, of the IMM used to run a series of conferences, and then we got involved with that, and continued producing uh, very good conferences, good attendances from industry. At the same time, the education in Wollongong started moving towards the research. So we, I remember we started first the uh, research on coal and gas at first, mm -hmm. and with the help of uh, late Riku Lama, we set up the uh, gas research labs which is still ongoing now, still successful. And at the same time, there was a move towards uh, rock bolting and effective ground control. So then, at that time, joint colleagues supported funds to rapid rock bolting uh, technology we developed in Wollongong. So what is rapid Rapid rock bolting, bolting technology. But what it means is that the rock bolting started in 1948 or so, uh, whereby you drill a hole, then put the bolt, insert the bolt into the ground and anchor it there mechanically. It's kind of a wet ship. Um, over the years, since 60s and 70s, there has been the uh, um, introduction of chemical anchors, which means using aerodite type of styles where you insert the bolt and inject in either cementitious products or resin, chemical resin, it holds the bolt itself, then you tighten the bolt. It means drill, mm -hmm. then put the uh, capsule of resin into it, rotate it, oh, no, sorry, that's a chemical one, the, uh, apply, the turn the bolts around and the wedges opens up, or rather push it up with the wedge goes in and holds the bolt against the bolt. Um, then, we started working on self-drilling, self-tapping bolt, whereby you had a hollow tube drilling into the hole and let the tube stay there and inject the resins into it. And that, that was what's called rapid bolting. And the research on both gas and bolting continued, but effectively started in 1987, where we continue until today, not only on solid rock bolts, but also with cable bolts, flex sand, or what's called, I'm kind of hurried up. During that period, there was an interest on running conferences. 
So we continuously started, uh, started running continuous conference in 1998. Prior to that, there were a number of conferences I used to organize, but this one, since 1998, we've been running conferences annually, and it's now considered one of the longest running conferences in the history of this university. And it's one of the iconic conferences serving coal mining industry in Australia and worldwide. Wow. This is important. All the papers published in that conference, it is uh, made available online through help of my telephone. And all the, the library of this university has become digital library of the world for coal mining industry, and that's been demonstrated by the number of hits we have. So the success of the conference continues, and the next conference is on the 7th or to 9th of February next year. So uh, hopefully we'll have the attendance. Uh, so I am not going to go further than that to say uh, mining is still continuing here. We have now six academics, and there are also a number of retired individual continuing research, and we are producing work. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Naj. So, could I finally just ask you, Jan, just to talk about the future directions of mining and what it means for the university students and your experiences, perhaps, just to... Okay. Um, it has been discussed over here that Mining has actually come up, from, you know, historically up. The technology has increased, and the price has increased, and it actually got to what it is now. We do not teach history to students over here, but I thought it's a bit of a problem. We have students from overseas, we have students from uh, Australia, which are not related to mining, but we also have students who have some. Um, uh, history in, in a family of mining, so they perhaps know what happened in the past. So it is really fantastic that we do have a room like this in here in the library because our students will come here, will see this, this and will come here and study what has happened before. And I will go and look at the posters and look at these people over there, yeah, they haven't got any, anything on their heads. Look at this poster, man came but the horses are falling down and it's sort of something which they haven't seen before and it's just absolutely great for them to be exposed to that. And hopefully these people, not only did they, lot, they will learn something about history and how far they actually went up in the HNS and technology, but also some of them will embrace the historical sort of flair within them and, and continue in that to actually uh, preserve the history for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That's fantastic and I appreciate it. You can see what I meant when I said we have a star study cast. We have a couple of minutes for, um, for questions um, before people perhaps have a look around at this wonderful exhibition that we have, which does draw on the university's fantastic archives and its wonderful digitisation program which is building history in, in a way that will make it accessible to the students and, and to the community in the future, which is keeping that circle going of the community and region and industry and, and coal and the university. And I think keeping that dialogue, it's more than a dialogue, a multi-log going is very, very important. So are there any questions? I can add one just about in terms of for the curriculum for students and the role and the importance of site visits and placements. Um, can any of you like to comment on that? Has that changed over the years with development of simulation software or um, what sort of exposure do the students get? We do have visits to the mines if we can achieve that because sometimes it's very difficult to have many if you have 10, 20 students, uh, it's very hard to get a mine. You can sort of break half a dozen of the maps so they can visit the mine. But it is very useful in the mines rescue station over here. They have the, uh, uh, what's it called again? Simulated. The, yeah, the, the virtual, virtual reality from underground. And it's actually real because I've been there many times and I, I, each time I go there I love it because you know, it's really looks real. So this is a very good exposure to students. And yes, every year we do take them there to actually see that. 
Anybody else in the I would regard to visits to the mines. Um, every year there is a trip to mines arranged, but normally local companies do give us a day on Fridays uh, as long as we make arrangements made for them. But don't forget, every year we take the students outside and beyond the coal mining area, we also go to metalliferous mines. And there's a team goes to Kauba, uh, Orange, as well as far back as uh, Tasmania. So the active one. But I'd like to say something here. Congratulations to the library for organizing this uh, occasion. And it's also very important that this setup should remain as it is, but have the students studying here and keeping this history alive. You cannot see history in the virtual library centers 10, 15 kilometers away, because this is the area visited by the future generations. This should remain and should be developed as a minor museum or minor display of the history whereby younger generation can come and look at the center and carry on with their studies. Because we don't know, and I'll be very, very frankly, we don't know how long education in Wollongong in mining will continue. Because we're also bound by the number of mines operating here and condition. I'm talking realistically. It's going to be beyond us. We may not be here in 20 years to come, but I think this kind of display show lives forever, and I hope you will maintain it. <laughs>